the first time that I worked with Dr. Uh, Norman Shumway was in July of 1989. He was simply uh, the most delightful personality in the operating room, in addition to being outside the operating room, a very color uh, colorful character. But inside the operating room, he set a tone that was just uh, so smooth, so easy. He put everyone at ease. He expected excellence and everyone to do their job, but he made it a lot of fun. And, you know, there's, it's a very complex team of people to do heart surgery. You have anesthesiologists, you have to have specialized nurses, the surgeons, the perfusionists. And he managed that whole team uh, like a uh, conductor of an orchestra. And it, it was just a delight uh, to be in his operating room. The transplant that we did in 1981, Dr. Shumway and I, uh, was the uh, first successful heart and lung transplant. There actually had been uh, four previous heart lung transplants in patients uh, in other centers around the world. This was the first at Stanford and the first patient to survive leave the hospital and be benefited. Remembering that in 1990, uh, when I got to do my first heart transplant, that all of this work had been done by Dr. Shumway to figure out exactly how to do this procedure some 30 years later, and that it hadn't changed a bit. It was still the same procedure that he worked out in the lab with uh, Dr. Lauer. Uh, another one of uh, Dr. Shumway's great principles was to keep it simple. He, he was very much uh, no wasted motions, keep it very simple, uh, and, and so that's the beauty of, uh, of the technique that he developed that is still used today and really hasn't been modified. One of the things that um, has improved certainly is our understanding of the mechanisms of heart failure and, and the development of new um, small molecules or drugs to treat heart failure. Uh, beyond that, the realization that as uh, the heart's function goes, decreases over time, that there's a propensity for sudden death or cardiac arrest. So the development of uh, defibrillators to put into patients, which is like a pacemaker with a battery that can detect life-threatening uh, heart uh, irregularities or arrhythmias and to shock the patients, that's been an advancement that um, is given to patients with heart failure. And then the use of uh, smaller and smaller mechanical devices, uh, small uh, artificial hearts to support patients. I think we're now coming to the third generation of those devices. And I think that that will be a viable alternative going forward to treat larger number of patients. But the next frontier is the in intense uh, investigation and, and excitement around the use of stem cells to treat heart failure. There are adult stem cells which are usually derived from the bone marrow and there are embryonic stem cells which are obviously uh, derived from embryos. Repairing the heart or regenerating the heart I think uh, will be left to embryonic stem cells or either uh, nuclear reprogramming, nuclear transfer to, to get to the growth of new heart muscle. Um, the problem with embryonic stem cells is that not only they, can they potentially develop into every tissue in the body, the reality is that they do. So if one were to put st embryonic stem cells undifferentiated into the heart, then they would develop into new heart muscle, but they would also develop into bone and other type of tissues that, uh, that are not wanted there. And, and we've got to solve that problem before, before it's going to be a reality for treating patients. As Dr. Shumway used to say, uh, immune tolerance is the future and always will be. <laughs> uh, but it's the kind of holy grail of transplantation to think that we can somehow manipulate the immune system to recognize the donor organ as self. And if that is the case, then uh, suppression and generally that r increases the risk of infection would be uh, absent. So it's, it's what we're uh, ultimately moving towards. And I think looking ahead in, in the next 40 years, uh, I, I would feel confident that eventually we'll understand the system well enough that, that uh, there'll be uh, some way to induce this type of specific tolerance. One of the things that distinguishes the Stanford program is its longevity, of course. Uh, beginning in 
January of 1968 with the first transplant. It's been continuously active since that time. And this uh, is by far the, the longest continually active program in the world. Uh, at first, Dr. Shumway's uh, leadership and charisma kept everything going. But then uh, I think a, a body of, of very competent people working in um, all the different fields that impact transplant came together and, and it became established and it has just become an organic thing that continues to thrive. Uh, I think it's as, as strong, if not stronger now, than it's ever been.